In the Batman universe, there was a, a film that came out not too long ago that focused on the backstory of the Joker. And some of you may have seen it, and it opens up with Arthur Fleck, this, this man who just seems to be pitiable, putting makeup on as he gets ready to do his clown job. And his job this particular day is um, flipping a sign out in front of a business. And some teenagers come by, and they grab his sign, and they take off, and Arthur runs by afterwards and tries to track him down, turns down this, this alleyway, and of course these, these thugs are waiting for him, and they jump him, and they beat him. And just right off the bat, not only is he a pitiful character, but you, you feel empathy for him because of just the cruelty of this world. As the film goes on, we discover that Arthur Fleck has this, this characterization where he just laughs uncontrollably at the most inappropriate times, and, and he can't control it. And this one particular scene, it just lasts a minute as you watch him uncomfortably laugh, trying to, to bring this under control. And, and sometimes you can't even tell if he's laughing or crying, and your heart just breaks for him. And after a moment, he does gain control of it, and he catches his breath, and he looks up at his counselor and says, is it just me? Or is it getting crazier out there? This relationship with this counselor is, is very interesting. It's, it's set in just a dark, dank place, and she's almost mechanical in his, in his uh, interactions with her, or his, her interactions with him. Sorry, I've been talking all day long, so, which is good, but my tongue is tired. That doesn't mean I'm going to preach any shorter, so don't get any thoughts on that. So he, he returns back another day, and you really see him smile for the first time. Not a fake smile, but, but a good smile. And he says to his counselor, until a little while ago, it was like nobody ever saw me. Even I didn't know if I really existed. And she interrupts him and says, Arthur, I have some bad news for you. And he responds by saying, you don't listen, do you? I don't think you ever really hear me. You just ask the same questions every week. How's your job? Are you having any negative thoughts? All I have are negative thoughts. But you don't listen. Anyway, as I said, my whole life, I didn't know if I really even existed, but I do. People are starting to notice. The camera pans back to his counselor, who uncomfortably tells him, they're cutting our funds. They're closing our offices next week. This is the last time we'll be meeting. And in that moment where author has joy thinking people see him, he feels like the system is now against him. The last kind of hope that he had in meeting with his counselor for any kind of sanity is now being taken away from him. And so you watch him kind of devolve from this, this hapless character that you feel pity for to the man who would become the Joker and eventually the arch villain of Batman. As the show progresses, uh, there's a scene where he's in a comedy club and he's telling jokes that are just horrible. And a late night comedian gets tape of it and he shows it to his crowd really to make fun of Arthur. And they found out that millions of people just loved it. And so they invited him onto the show. And so he comes in his makeup and asks to be introduced as the Joker. And in interviewing the Joker, Murray talks to him and said, and uh, they're going back and forth, and at one point Joker says, everybody is awful these days. It's enough to make anyone crazy. Everybody just yells and screams at each other. Nobody's civil anymore. Nobody thinks that it's what it's like to be the other guy. And then he, you just, you, you worry about this man because he's, he's very unstable, and he gets up and he does this, this act of violence to the talk show host, and and his fate is sealed as the Joker. You watch his evolution take place. But that line, is it just me, or is it getting crazier out there, is something that resonates with me. I've talked with a lot of people. Is that, I mean, we live in a post-Genesis 3 fallen world, and so in one sense it's always been crazy, but it seems like it's getting crazier, doesn't it? And I don't know if it just has always been crazy. We have more access to the news. So it's been interesting talking to different people and getting their take on that. But have you ever wondered that? Is it just you, or is it really getting crazier out there? I think Asaph would have said, <laughs> yeah, it feels like it is getting crazier out there. 
As we mentioned this morning, Asaph was this musician who led worship in Israel, and he composed a, a dozen psalms that we have in the book of Psalms. And the one we're looking at is his confession about how he almost ditched his faith. So we're just going to steal that title from the Joker and use it for our study tonight. Is it just me, or is it getting crazier out there? And we're going to jump in at verse 1 and just kind of rehearse what we did this morning and then spend some time in the uncomfortableness of this psalm. So let's pray and ask the Lord to teach us tonight. Lord, we praise you for uh, giving us the blessing of this retreat and the opportunity to be together and to witness the beauty of this land and to encourage one another and to develop friendships and make new friendships. What a blessing this is. And what a great opportunity we have just to open the scriptures and seek to understand uh, this ancient wisdom that is contained there that helps us understand more of who you are and more of who we are and helps us to understand your good work for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we ask, Lord, that you would be with us this evening in the midst of a, a long, good day and help us to, to give our hearts to this text and to, to think through what it is that you're saying in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we started out this morning with verse 1, and we noticed that Asaph said, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And we dialed in on that phrase, God is good, and we said that is just a basic confession of the faith. To believe that God is good all the time, all the time God is good, is, is a good conviction to have. And we want to lean into that, we want to experience it, we want to enjoy it. But we also ask the question, what would it take to shatter your confidence that God is good all the time? I feel like for many of us, it's, it only takes a, a certain amount of time living into this wor- in, in this world to just come up across things that make us scratch our heads and to try to, to figure out how do we reconcile that God is good with what we see going on in this world. And so that's the journey that Asaph takes us on. And he tells us, but as for me, my feet had almost st- stumbled. My steps had nearly slept, slipped. Excuse me. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he has this conviction, God is good, but he looks around them and he sees people getting away with it. They're prospering, and this is not the way it's supposed to be. The people of God, the people who have faith, the people who are, who are trying to live according to the commandments of God, those are the ones who should be prospering. But he looks around, and he sees all the wrong people being blessed, it seems, and he doesn't know what to do with that. And the real core issue was envy. It's not just he saw it and despised it. He saw it, and then something was happening in him that actually wanted what they had. And so we saw this morning that basically he told us he envied the shalom, the peace of their trouble-free existence, of their unrestrained lifestyle, their arrogant speech, of their rebellious autonomy. And that's where he got stuck. And he told us in verse 13, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. He tells us, I tried to live this life of faith, and it didn't pay off. In fact, all I got, it seems like, was opposition in my own soul, my relationship with God. Something is broken, something's off there. I feel stricken and rebuked. He told us in verse 15, you remember from this morning, if I said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He felt like he couldn't talk about his struggles with his brothers and sisters. And that's a lonely place to be, isn't it? To wonder if everything is just getting crazier out there, or is it just me? But to not be able to talk about it with anyone. Because if you were to, to really voice some of your doubts, some of your questions, I mean, you're already feel, feeling your faith slip away. What if, what if you accidentally make someone else's faith slip away? And so he feels stuck there. Let me take just a side note here. I was talking with my friend Shar afterwards, and we we're talking about being honest to God. And that's, that's a good place to get to. But we also noted that sometimes it, it's hard to be honest with other Christians. And for some of us, it's no problem to be honest with God. We can tell him what we're thinking. But we feel like we have to guard it with other believers, right? We can't tell him what we're really thinking. And so if we can be honest to God, then the, could it be the case that we could be honest with one another as well? That, that we can talk about how we're struggling some of the questions we're wrestling with. It's a terrible place to be isolated and to feel like you can't talk 
with your brothers and sisters in the faith, when that's part of what the community of faith is designed to do. I hope New City is always a place where we can just be honest and raw and say, hey, I'm struggling here. This is what I'm thinking. I know it's wrong. Can you pray for me? Can you help me think what's going on here? Because we don't have that. Man, it's a terrible place to be. And that's where Asaph finds himself. He said, I can't talk about this with anyone because I would betray I would betray them. And so he says in verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. When he tried to get his mind around how it's possible that everyone who doesn't care about God seems to be blessed, and those who, are, who, who do care about God are not getting the blessings, he, he just couldn't get his mind around it. He, he was exhausted by it. And so I don't know if he ever had that thought. Is it me? Or is it getting crazier out there? But I think that's kind of where Asaph is living right now. And so I asked you this morning, have you ever wrestled with the problem of evil? I want us to see what Asaph is doing, but I want you to be thinking about your own struggles with the faith, your own questions that you have about what God is doing or has done or has allowed to happen, to personalize that, to think through that. And so we mentioned this morning as well, that Asaph is indeed wrestling with this problem of evil, but in many ways it can be described as wrestling with the problem of good. Why do good things happen to the bad people, to the wrong people, the ones who don't care? And so for many people, this, this notion of the problem of evil, or why do bad things happen, is something that is, it, it just seals the deal, and they, they don't want to consider the faith. Many people outside the faith ask questions about how could it possibly be that if God is good and loving that these bad things happen in this world. And many people who are in the faith wrestle with this as well. Some people describe this as, as a defeater belief. It's, a, it's one belief that you hold and that you're sure of that kind of defeats any other consideration of other beliefs that might uh, challenge it. So let me, let me give you this illustration. So if I told you that there were giant unicorns on display in downtown Calgary, like real live, genuine, never before seen unicorns on display tonight in downtown Calgary. Let's go. I mean, how many people would go? I mean, some people might be like, yeah, I want to check that out. <laughs> Anything's possible, right? But some people go, there's no such thing as unicorns. This guy is trying to trick me, right? And that's because you hold a defeater belief that at the mere suggestion that there might be a real thing as a unicorn in downtown Calgary just causes it to not be even considered. And so for some people, this issue of the problem of evil, the problem of suffering in this world, is a defeater belief. It automatically rules out any consideration that God could be good. And Asaph's trying to hold those two in tension, and he's feeling his, his faith slip through his fingers. Some of you may have read David Hume in university. He kind of stated the question classically. If he, that is God, is willing to prevent evil but not able, then he's impotent. Is he able but not willing, then he's malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Do you feel the, the wrestling there, trying to get head around, you know, correct belief about God, but trying to figure out all the human tragedy and how that can fit together. And so Hume really paved the way for, for many people and articulated this. So the question is, is how do we make sense of suffering? We're going to kind of sit in this uncomfortableness of where Asaph is and take a step back and kind of think about this um, from, a, from a Christian worldview. So how do we make sense of suffering? How do you make sense of it in your own life? Well, there's, there's basically three different broad answers to this. And the first one is, is pantheism. And pantheism is a worldview in which everything is one. And if, if you believe, as certain, for example, Eastern religions believe, that the desire is the problem. The reason why you, you, you suffer, the reason why you hurt, is because you desire things. If you believe that, then the answer becomes you need to shut your desire down. It's, it's to not desire. Th if, you don't, if you don't desire, then you won't get hurt. And so it's almost kind of, a, a, you know, in the West, it's stoicism, right? Get to this place where you can rise above everything that happens in this world and not be impacted by it, to not feel it. 
in another iteration of, of Eastern religions, there's this notion of karma. And that if, if you're suffering, if you're feeling pain, well, you've done something to deserve that. You're, you're paying for something that happened in a, in a past life. And so with pantheism, suffering is always your fault. Either you desire and you shouldn't be desiring, and that's your problem, or if you're suffering, then you're obviously paying for your sin in the past, and that's coming back to roost now. But that's one way of making sense of, of suffering. Another way of understanding it is the answer that atheism gives, which is basically tough luck. It sucks to be you. Some people are lucky, some people are not, but that's just the way it is. And, and don't take that from me. Let me give you an illustration from Alex Rosenberg. He has this book called The Atheist Guide to Reality. And let me just say, apart from reading Scripture, nothing strengthens my faith like reading atheist literature. And I, I, I don't say that to demean it, but, but to think through the alternative, really, to Christianity, that God does not exist, and to hear what they put forth, it just kind of confirms me more in my faith. Not everyone's there, and if anyone here kind of is, is embracing atheism, I'm not trying to make fun of you, but I'm trying to, to work out the logical implications of that. So Alex Rosenberg, who is an atheist, wrote an atheist guide to, to reality, and he kind of makes up his own catechism, right? Some of us in, in this church know a catechism. We, it's a question-answer format to kind of teach younger people or anyone, really, the elements of the faith. And so he makes his own catechism to describe atheism. And so he asks the question, is there a God? And the answer is no. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? Because it makes you feel better. Is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like forbidden, permissible, or sometimes obligatory? Anything goes. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing. I wonder what you think as you hear this atheist catechism about what you ought to believe if you believe there is no God. I imagine for most of, most of us, this is a pretty dim way of looking at the world. And I want to contend that this is just simply not livable. I mean, it's one thing to be able to say this, but in actuality, can you actually say there's no right or wrong, there's no good or bad, anything goes? Well, how about bullying? Is that okay? I mean, some people might not like it, but, but is that wrong? What about Bibi Aisha, who was married to an older man as a teenager and tried to escape that abusive relationship and was captured and beaten and had her nose cut off her face? Is that neither wrong or right, good or bad? Does anything go? Well, what about genocide? <laughs> Is that good or bad? What about child sacrifice? What about, and I bring this up with, with people I have conversations about who, who do embrace atheism. I was like, well, what about church leaders who have molested children? Is that good or bad? They're most always, yeah, that's definitely bad. Okay, so there's some things that are just wrong in this world. Yes. But atheism as a worldview says there's nothing good or evil. Anything goes from the mouth of leading atheists who write catechisms for people to understand. There's a TV producer named Vince Gilligan. You may know him as the creator of Breaking Bad. And Breaking Bad was a morality tale, and I'm not going to give any summaries on that. Just know that he was the one who did that. So if you ever saw Breaking Bad or heard about it, he's the guy behind it. And he, he, he gave an interesting interview one time, and he said this, I'm pretty much agnostic at this point in my life. Agnosticism is, is the belief that you're not sure God exists or not. Atheism says God doesn't. Agnosticism says I don't know theism says, I do believe, right? So he says, I'm pretty much agnostic at this point in my life, but I find atheism just as hard to get my head around as I find fundamental Christianity, because if there's no such thing as cosmic justice, what is the point of being good? That's the one thing no one has ever explained to me. 
Why shouldn't I go rob a bank, especially if I'm smart enough to get away with it? What's stopping me? If there is no cosmic justice, if there is no God, let's get away with what we can get away with, right? I mean, that's what the wicked were doing in Asaph's time. They're like, God doesn't know. He doesn't care. They're oppressing others, violent, and getting rich off of it. Dostoevsky wrote the book, The Brothers Karamazov, which I read a couple years ago. I would commend it. I know it's a beast of a book to get through, but you need to do it at some point in your life. But basically, he communicates in that, that this philosophy that if God does not exist, everything is permissible. Everything's permissible. Some of you know the story of C.S. Lewis. He was a professor at Oxford, and he really began his career convinced of atheism. But as he talked with some of his friends, J.R.R. R. Tolkien being one of them, and as they talked about Christianity, he began to see some of his, his beliefs begin to crumble. And in Mere Christianity, he wrote something very interesting. As he looked back at that time when he was a convinced atheist, but things started falling apart for him, he said, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of, uh, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. And then he concludes with this statement, consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. You see what he's saying there? He's like, he's living as an atheist in this world, and he's seeing bad things happen and injustices being committed. But what is justice? What is injustice? If it's just my, my personal preference, then, then is it really unjust? And so it began to collapse, and he says atheism is, is really too simple of an answer. So with atheism, evil is merely a subjective evaluation, and suffering is just the way things are. There's no good or bad in it. It's just the way things are. And if you happen to suffer, well, that's just tough luck. It just happens. Of course, the third option is what philosophers talk about generally as theism. And Christianity in particular says evil and suffering are real, even if how they fit into the story of the world is mysterious or perplexing. Evil and suffering is a real thing. It's not an illusion. It's not nothing. It is a real thing. So the question is, is how do we make sense of that? How do we, how do we live in a world where that happens with a God who is who's good? And you know, I've been able to, to have conversations with so many people over the years, and even just hearing some of your stories today, and just some of the, the devastation that some of you have been through. The, the question just surfaces, why, God, is there so much of this? Why does it hurt so much? And I think that's a good question to ask. It's a good question to ask. That's what Asaph is asking. Why is there so much suffering, Lord? Why are the, the wrong people getting away with it, committing violence and oppression, getting rich off of it, why does that hurt so much? I read this book recently by Gavin Ortland called Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. And let me just say, if I were to write a book, this is what I would have written. <laughs> I've been thinking about one in the back of my head for a long time, and I read his, I'm like, I don't have to write it now. And so let me commend this book to you. It is super good, but listen to what he says. He admits, he says, theism has no neat and tidy answer to such devastation. But one thing theism can do, which naturalism or atheism cannot, is to tell you why it hurts so badly. For on theism, evil really is a perversion, a desacralizing, a fall, a twisting of what, of what things should be. The problem of evil is indeed a real problem for theism, for a problem at least might have a solution. And in the story of Christianity, the solution is presented to us. Asaph is trying to grasp that with what he knows. He knows that God has promised to renew all things. A day of justice is coming. God will set this world to right. He's living before Jesus. He doesn't know exactly how this is going to work itself out. 
but that's where he is. And so to reiterate the point we made this morning by John Frame, he said the Bible is preoccupied with the problem of evil. The whole Bible addresses the problem of evil, for the story turns on the entrance of sin and evil in this world and on God's plan for dealing with it. So if you think about the story that the Scripture gives to us, everything begins with God creating this world and declaring it is good. And he steps back when he's done and says it is very good. But with the fall of humanity and turning our backs upon God, we grasp for other things that we thought were good. And so, of course, humanity was banished from the presence of God, and evil began to flourish. In fact, in Genesis 6, not too long in the story, God looks at humanity and sees that all their thoughts and intentions are only evil continually. It's like the author is stacking descriptions there. And so... The interesting thing, though, is evil doesn't have an independent existence. It attaches itself to something good in this world. And so when we see evil happening, suffering happening, we know that it's happening to to human beings created in the image of God. And evil is perverting that. It's attaching itself. And so there's a great quote by Tim Keller. He said, suffering is actually at the heart of the Christian story. It's not something that Christianity ignores. And it's part of the reason why we're talking this morning about how we need to be honest to God when we wrestle with suffering. But it's actually at the very heart of the Christian story. You remember at Christmas time, we sing that song, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And there has this, there's this line in the middle of it that says, Come to earth to taste our sadness. He whose glories knew no end. At the celebration of the birth of Jesus, we sing hymns like this. And we remind ourselves that the problem of evil is something that God himself was willing to not only to come to this world, but also to, to experience it and to take suffering on, uh, on himself, which is what we, we teach in the gospel. Jesus came and he lived in a very broken world full of human tragedy. And when he was on the cross, he had the sins of people like you and me laid upon him. And there God condemned it in his flesh. And so God didn't stay distant. He's not out there but doesn't care. He cares so much that he comes close and takes evil and suffering upon himself. As the Apostle John said, he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. God cares deeply about the suffering of this world. Back to Tim Keller. In his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, He writes this. He says, Only Christianity, of all the world's major religions, teaches that God came to earth in Jesus Christ and became subject to suffering and death himself. See what this means, he asks? Yes, we do not know the reason God allows evil and suffering to continue or why it is so random, but now at least we know what the reason is not. It cannot be that he does not love us, It cannot be that he does not care. He is so committed to our ultimate happiness that he was willing to plunge into the greatest depths of suffering himself. He understands us. He has been there, and he assures us that he has a plan to eventually wipe away every tear. Someone might say, but that's only half an answer to the question why. Yes, but it's the half we need. We don't have all the answers of why God allows suffering. We wrestle with the same issues that Asaph was wrestling with. But with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we get more answers, and really the answers that we need. That God cares, that he took suffering upon himself, and he will eventually eradicate it when he renews all things. And of course, we have the anchor of that in the gospel of Jesus himself. I was talking with someone earlier today just about the tragedy that they've experienced and we've experienced. And if, if I didn't have the hope that one day God would renew all things, I don't know what I would do. It would be tough not to ditch the faith. I mean, really, if you look at this world, to experience the pain of this world and to not wrestle deeply with that, that would be really hard to do. But I was telling this individual, my anchor is actually the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection. Think about this. If we showed up on Friday afternoon when Jesus was crucified, it seemed like evil prevailed, right? 
but three days later, Christ rose again from the dead. And what God has done for Jesus Christ, he will one day do for this entire creation. And it's not merely wish fulfillment. That's, I mean, I can't just say, I hope that happens. It's as sure as Jesus Christ coming back from the dead. And that is the anchor, my friends, I believe, that, that keeps us from falling ultimately into despair. And so Asaph tells us, when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a worrisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. It was worrisome, exhausting. And so he goes to worship this God who is unpredictable, not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And I just don't know, I'm just going to go to the house of worship. And then something changed. And we'll talk about that more in the morning. So is it crazy you're out there? Or is it just you? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of both, right? <laughs> There's a, a lady I follow on Twitter. Her name's Rebecca McLaughlin, and she's a good writer in, in talking about issues of Christianity and faith. And someone posed the question, why are you still a Christian? And she answered by saying, because it's the least crazy option out there. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's where I live. And Asaph was before Jesus, but Asaph was, was leaning into this possibility. It's a crazy world out there. And so, my friends, can I, what we believe is kind of crazy. Can we admit that? That God became a human being and lived a perfect life and was crucified and came back from the dead and promises to come back one day and make everything new and perfect? I mean, that's weird, isn't it? I mean, if you don't think that's weird, you haven't been talking to people <laughs> who don't believe that because they'll tell you it's weird. And it may be weird and it may be crazy, but it is the least crazy option out there. <laughs> There's that time when Jesus was preaching and everything was going great until he told them that they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood if they want to have eternal life. And the crowd started thinning <laughs> to the point where his disciples came to him and Jesus says, are you guys going to leave too? And you remember what Peter said. He's like, where else can we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And I've always appreciated that as I've thought about that because it tells me that Peter was thinking about his options. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, Jesus is saying some pretty crazy things. And he just like sealed the deal with that thing about eating his blood and drinking. I mean, that's just weird. But as he thought about it, this is really the least crazy option. And Asaph, he's going to get there in this psalm, and we're going to see what happens when he goes to, to the temple to worship. His faith, which was oriented rightly, was disoriented and almost wrecked. And then he went to go worship God, and something happened to him there that reoriented and changed everything. And he went through all his doubts and all his questions, and he came out with a stronger, deeper, more solid conviction that God is good, and in fact, really, is only good. And so we're going to see that tomorrow morning. So, my friends, no, it's not just you. <laughs> it does seem like it's getting crazier out there, but the way things are now are not the way things will always be. Jesus is king, and the kingdom of heaven is coming. So hold tight, my friends. Let's pray. Lord, as we sit in this awkwardness of Asaph wrestling with deep, deep questions about faith and suffering. We kind of get what he's saying. We look at this world and it just seems like it is crazy out there. And the gospel comes to us with crazy news that a man from Nazareth was willing to lay down his life for people like us. And it just, it just seems almost too good to be true. And then to hear that what what God did for Jesus in raising him from the dead, he intends to do with the entire cosmos. That just is wild. But Lord, we thank you for the, the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus as the king of this universe. And we look forward to the day when he does set everything to right. In the meantime, Lord, as we struggle, as we wrestle with questions, as we try to make sense of this life that doesn't make sense, would you preserve us in this faith that you've given to us in Christ? And no matter how hard it gets, help us understand that, that really the gospel is the least crazy option out there. And so thank you for giving it to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, I think Kim is going to come up and make an announcement. Is that right?